Good morning. I am Jim Grieber, and we are conducting this interview today at the Public Library of Cincinnati in Hamilton County. Today, we're fortunate to have World War II veteran Jonathan Ezra Smith with us. He has served honorably and courageously in combat in European theater of operations during World War II with the United States Army. Also today, handling transportation for the veteran, we have his son Johnny and his daughter Glenda. Jonathan, uh, before I begin, I'd also like to introduce Dennis Daly, the cameraman, yes. and mention that this interview is sponsored by the United States Library of Congress, the Veterans History Project, and you will be able to access this interview eventually online, not only through the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County, but also through the United States Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. So thank you very much for joining us today. And I'd like to begin by asking you to generally describe the, uh, the mood of the community when uh, you were involved in getting enlisted in the service. Oh. Before the war in, say, 1938-39, uh, in those years, I had a feeling that I would be in the military, that we, our country, would be involved in a war. And as I, the years grew uh, real quick then, and the young men were all being uh, drafted or volunteering for the military and everyone would see me a great big old strung out boy. I was about six foot two and weighed 185 or so pound and why aren't you in the military? Why aren't you in the military? So uh, it got poor. It kind of wore on me a little bit and I decided that I would like to to uh, or needed to go to the military. <coughs> My brother and I, Kenneth, were uh, youth there on the farm when the first casualty of World War II from Pendleton County was announced and sent home. And at that time, the rural mail carrier took the news to the family, and the mail carrier came and got my brother Kenneth and I, and we went with him and gave the news to the uh, family. Did they deliver that? Letter personally, or just put it in the mail. Box. They delivered it personally. It was an obligation. After it was in along at about five or six o'clock in the afternoon that we went to the home, got to the home. So it was a separate delivery yes. of the United States mail. Yes. The yes. Home of record. And personally, yes, personally. And uh, I decided to get into the military so I went to the Marine Corps and talked to them. I think immediately they saw that I wasn't of age and they let me know right quick that they didn't want me and that didn't stop me at all so I wanted to go then and did I went up to Wright Patterson oh. field, stayed all night there. Next morning early they came picked me up and took me over and showed me a lot of things there in the, the base and also gave me an examination, which I passed. But uh, immediately after I concluded the test, the, uh, he's a colonel, a full colonel, I think, he called me up front and he said, now you've passed and you're privileged, you can stay. But with the lack of mathematical background, I would advise you to withdraw right now. I didn't think at the time that they were giving education to young men, and I did not have a common school education. I uh, quit school in the seventh grade, or pardon me, the eighth grade. I went three months in the eighth grade and quit because I didn't have uh, any concern for it. I wasn't interested in my Dad did not believe a boy should be educated. A strange thing, but uh, I went then and went down to the uh, Navy 
recruiter here in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. And they signed me up and I went over to Music Hall and they swore us in, took me to Great Lake Naval Training Station and they found that I wasn't of age and they sent me home and I have a card that where my dad had to sign to get me in there. So I went back to the Naval Training Station. Didn't do but very little boot training. I did some, but mostly I drove a truck around in Chicago moving furniture from one office to another and got to know Chicago a little bit. And one morning for breakfast, they had, uh, I think it was a capon or something that was cold and uh, I got sick. And I ran to the door, of course, it was come out. And they said that I wanted blood, but I don't know. But they picked me up immediately and took me to the sick bay. And they kept me in the sick bay there for at least two weeks or more. And they finally, they called me in. The officer had hash marks all the way up his shoulder. Been in there a long time. And uh, he told me that I had stomach ulcers and broken arches. Mm -hmm. And I, he said, I'm going to send you home. And I said, well, can't you get me straightened out of this? I want to stay in the Navy. And he burst out with a little oath and he said, no, but you'll make damn good army bait. So he said, now, you will have a 90-day custody where you cannot join any other organization. And I said, well, I would like to uh, stay in the Navy. And he said, no, that's out of the question. So I went home and uh, had a good doctor, Dr. Comer, and he treated the ulcers and nothing to do for the feet. But uh, four days after the 90-day custody was up, I was drafted into the Army and down Fort, not Fort Thomas. And from there I went to Cape Swift, Texas, to the, uh, which they did not have the uh, camp uh, completed, nor the division activated at the time, but they were working on that. So there was so few officers, and those that were there thought because I had been in the Navy that I knew all about the military. So I was given some jobs that I was capable of handling, really, of breaking down rations and clothing, seeing that the men got, that were there got time to go into town. I'd have to haul them in, go get them when they was drunk, bring them back, all of those things. And uh, I'd like to comment that that's an extraordinary introduction into military life. You started with the Marine Corps. Yeah. They said you're not of age. Right. You went to the Air Force. They said we'll let you in, but they recommended that you don't come in because of education. Then you went to the United States Navy in Cincinnati, who sent you to the Great Lakes Training Center. And they said you have to go home and get a paper or a document showing that you have parental position or uh, authority, parental uh, approval to go into the United States Navy. And to change my birth certificate because to change I birth. had my at, I told them that I was Jonathan Ezra Smith born on February the third, nineteen twenty two, when in fact I was born in twenty three and what they said that they had a birth certificate for a James Jacob Smith, born on February the 3rd, 1923. So I had to go to, with my father, to Louisville, to the Bureau of Vital Statistics, to have that changed. And the lady, immediately she looked up and asked me, said, do you have any proof that you were born? And I said, yes, ma'am, I'm standing right in front of you. She said, you're smart of it, too. <laughs> So I, I got my uh, name changed and proved that I was not of age, but acceptable with my father's permission. So I went back then to the Navy, and then when I, I got sick, and they uh, gave me a special order 
discharge. I have that, a special order discharge, and then uh, 90 day custody. Four days afterward, I was in the in the army and, and at Fort or at Camp Swift, Texas, and I took all kinds of training there. For uh, there was three men able or knowledgeable to drive. None of us had a uh, driver's license, but there was none of the other men that even knew how to drive. So we uh, took care of teaching others to drive, breaking down rations, getting the supplies to them, taking them to town for recreation, and th those things. Uh, then uh, I volunteered three times to go overseas while, after I finished my basic training and uh, usually it was with others, never volunteered by myself, but with others. And invariably they took the others and didn't take me. Now what time period or year did that attempt to go in the Marine Corps, the Air Force, the Navy, well, this would have and been the U.S. Army take place? 42, 41, 42 in, the, in that period because I went in the service in 43. This is one of the reasons why your generation is called the greatest generation because you persistently tried four different services and succeeded in getting into the war effort. Yeah. Thank you. Well, the uh, pressure, I guess that's what you'd call it, pressure, I never thought of that, uh, of people wondering why you weren't in the service because mm -hmm. I was uh, a pretty good sized boy and seemed to be in pretty good health, but uh, evidently wasn't as good as I thought. But they never would uh, take me overseas. I have a, a piece of paper in my pocketbook that I've carried all these years of uh, one of my sergeants, Sergeant Hobart Bremer from Harlington, Texas. And he and I went over to the uh, order room one night to the captain and volunteered to go overseas. They took over and left me. And he captured 300 Germans single hand. Oh my. Uh, it's quite a story. But uh, I would, this was said to me by one of the officers taken out of the Los Angeles paper, and I've carried it ever since then. We'd like to include that in the interview. Yes. Okay. I have that. It's in, the, it's in my pocket, I think, if it hasn't deteriorated. Did you have brothers that preceded you into the service? Uh, Brother Raymond was the first draftee out of Scott County, Kentucky. And then my brother Kenneth was drafted and he went to uh, Carl Gables, Florida and spent four years working in the hospital as a uh, medic. What service? Army. Army. It would have been Army. Yes. And Raymond was Army also? Raymond was Army. He was in Patton's 2nd Armored Division from its inception until they discharged him. And uh, uh, we left Camp Swift, went on maneuvers down in Louisiana, and then came to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri for uh, artillery training for the artillery. And of course, we as uh, others were just supply, we supplied. And then we went to California for uh, other training and uh, machine gun. Where in California? Uh, Camp Surf, California. Camp Surf. Was one of them. And then Camp San Luis Obispo. And there was another, and I cannot think of the name of it. Camp Roberts? Um, That's up no, near there. No. But uh, while there, uh, I was sent from up San Francisco driving a truck and uh, they told me to be very specific, don't stop, pick up anybody, you go by yourself. And I went to San Diego to the uh, uh, Naval Training Station and I had one gallon of paint in a two and a half ton cargo and it was suspended in every way to where it didn't uh, jar too much. It was an experimental paint, I found out later. And uh, while I was there, 
the one of the officers told me uh, at breakfast, he said, uh, you're going to go on the rifle range with us today. And I said, had all the rifles I need. And he said, no, where are you going? They had the carbine. Mm -hmm. And I'd never seen the carbine. And mm -hmm. I went out and I was a good shot. Good. And this little gun was the easiest thing to shoot that you ever saw. And he shoot five shots standing, five shots dealing, five shots prone. Mm -hmm. And I got 15 bullseyes. And he said, you're going to be in the Marine Corps. And I said, no, I'm in the Army. I tried the Marine Corps. They wouldn't have me. So, Did you develop skills as a marksman from shooting rabbits down in Scott oh, County? We, when we were children, we always carried a gun and shoot everything. Anything that moved was in danger. What rifle did you use? Was I, it? I used a 22 rifle. 22? Yeah. A little, Not black powder. A little single shot uh, Winchester okay. rifle. And of course, we had the uh, 12 gauge. I had 14, 410, 410 gauge shotgun for rabbits. Did you receive a marksman award for that event? Uh, this is something I wanted to tell you that I was never given the opportunity to qualify for marksman. I that was given the duty of setting up and maintaining the targets on the range one day, and I went out at four o'clock and at eight o'clock to pull the targets in, and the captain came and he said, "You're going to qualify for." Right? I said, "I'm too tired." I haven't eaten, and I said, I have no, no condition. And he said, you're going to fire anyway. Well, it's getting dark with a 30 caliber M1, and I had never fired the M1. And I made 148 out of the, to qualify, I had to have 150. And he wrote down 150. And that's the only qualification I got, which was not, it was not fair, it was not right. I uh, uh, fired with the, the 30 caliber machine gun, or, yeah, 30 caliber machine gun, 50 caliber machine gun, the uh, bazooka, the grenade launcher, and then the uh, 30 caliber on range. And I could, I could shoot well, and I was really discouraged by not being given the sure. opportunity sure. to. Uh, Qualify or get a marksman sure. or a uh, combat rifleman is what I was hoping for, but uh, didn't have the opportunity to do that. So that's something else. Uh, they sent me from Fort Fisher to Fort Fisher, North Carolina, mm -hmm. from Camp Surf, California, mm -hmm. <coughs> to teach officers and enlisted men. How to shoot the 50 caliber air cooled machine gun shooting at a moving target sleeve behind an airplane. And there was uh, several hundred of us, and I don't know why that I was given the charge of this duty when there was officers, enlisted men, uh, uh, non commissioned officers, and so forth, uh, learning and training. And I was telling how, first thing they pinned a, a mic, microphone on you, and I never had that done. That scared the heck out of me. And this voice came on, this is general so-and-so. You call, answer it, and kind of excited me a little bit. But uh, we took that training for about two weeks, uh -huh. teaching them maintenance and firing and all this and you had to be able to take that machine gun apart and put it back together in eight seconds. Eight seconds? Eight seconds. And it wasn't difficult to do after you learned that. Eight seconds. But uh, uh, I don't know how many men were there, but then they sent me back to Camp Surf and then went overseas. I went over on the uh, USS Monticellus, which was an old Italian freighter that they had taken, uh, captured and made into a combat or to a transport ship, and I was put on gun 
Blue Cross ad stand out. Where did you leave from? We left from, uh, from New York, or from, yeah, I guess it was New York, uh, up east there. Uh, the thing, we were trained, the 97th Infantry Division was trained for jungle combat. And just before we were uh, supposed to be deployed to the South Pacific, one of the officers from Chicago uh, went AWOL and were deserted, and he told what was going on. So they had to change the uh, uh, mission of the 97th Infantry Division to Europe. So they rushed us across the United States on troop trains, and uh, I was uh, guard on the door of the, one of the cars all the way across. And we got into, and I can't think of the name, uh, one of the uh, train stations and a piece of the track had been sawed out and the train derailed. Hmm. Fortunately, it wasn't going fast enough to turn over or anything like that, but it was a pretty rough ride for a while. And they, we got off there and uh, ran to the uh, train station and got on a, an electric train. And I was stationed on the back car with the conductor. And uh, when we started out in a 15 mile an hour speed limit, in the yard and had a speedometer on the back of this very fancy car. Mm. And I noticed it was getting on up there 78 mile an hour. And I said, mm. well, what about this? And he, the conductor said, we better move inside because mm. it'll start picking up the uh, uh, cinders and so forth. And so we went out of that yard pretty fast because they expected more. They were sure it was sabotage, so oh, they expected wow. more. So. It took us then we went out from there onto the ship and it took us uh, 12, I believe it was 12 days to go overseas in a convoy and uh, we encountered one submarine on the way over and of course they fired uh, death charges and got him pretty good but uh, they told us one uh, on the gun I was on a gun and they told us when it comes up you start shooting. Mm -hmm. So when it come up and they hollered fire, we had to start shooting. Uh, you wasn't doing any good or any harm because the ship just went straight up and went straight back down. They sent out boats, light boats, see if they could find anybody. But there was no one. They couldn't find get anyone. Did it sink any ships in the convoy? No, it did not. Didn't fire a shot or didn't learn. Didn't, didn't get a chance to. He was just moving in position when they sent the death charges in and uh, sub chaser they called them. Sure. And with the death charges and uh, and dry, uh, shot him out of or blowed him out of the water. And uh, then when we uh, landed in La Havre, France, and was taken from the boat on the big uh, tractor trailers to uh, Camp Lucky Strike. And uh, it was in the afternoon, just after lunch, and uh, we got something to eat, and the captain came to me and he said, I want somebody that I know of, and I can trust, I want you on the car post on that perimeter. And, uh, my feet, my arches having been broken and I couldn't get overshoes that would fit me. So I didn't have any overshoes and it was muddy. And it was cold at night and I stayed on guard duty all night. And next morning, four o'clock, mud was frozen up on my legs and the captain hollered and he said, Smith, I want you to get you something to eat and go to the ordinance and draw 10 trucks to be 10 of you. And I have the paper there with the officer in uh, a non-commissioned officer and so forth. That mm -hmm. There was just 10 of us went and drew these trucks to take to the British Army. And we got to the British Army and... Uh, How long was that transit from where to where? 
from that Camp Lucky Strike. Camp Lucky Strike, the next day about, I guess it was about five hours, four or five hours, something like that. To the Still in France? Oh yes, yes, right close there. I really don't think, didn't think too much of time because uh, I'm not thinking about it really. But when we drew the trucks and took them to the British 22nd Corps headquarters and asked that our trip tickets, which they usually sign, which gives you permission to leave, asked that they be signed, no, you're staying with us. That was the 22nd Corps headquarters of the British Army? British 22nd Corps headquarters, yes. They were a camouflage unit, supposed to be the best in the world. And uh, we loaded our trucks and trailers with camouflage material, as much as you could get on. And the battle, as I can understand and remember now, my memory isn't too good, but the Battle of the Balls is just uh, about concluded here, but there was a contingent of German soldiers up here ready to come down in here. And we went in between the German soldiers and the uh, ones fighting down here around the balls. And we went, they knew we couldn't come back. They didn't mind us going through because we couldn't come back. And we went up on the Rhine River to in between two towns, Wessels on the left, Reeves on the right. And this was a uh, ammunition depot at igloos and so forth there. And the only thing that was guarding it was Hitler Youth and we had a contingent of British scouts with us and uh, this is where we, this was our destination to get there. When we pulled into the compound where the British were and I, I was the lead truck and I pulled up and this sergeant was standing there and I said, hey Mac, where do you want these trucks? And he said, oh, I said, oh boy, how come you don't salute the sergeant? <laughs> I said, I don't salute no damn sergeant. <laughs> And he said, get the thing over here. So he came and told us later, he said, we can't cook for you. We don't have a medic. You have to fend for yourself while you're here, but you know what your duty is. So uh, it was getting along night, and uh, we, 10, were together together with our trucks and uh, parked them and got a trailer from them. And I told them, I said, well now we've been trained fellas to get in a low spot if you're going to sleep, sleep. So there was a very big dent in the ground and we went to sleep there. And at four o'clock in the morning they started shelling us. Mm. And uh, they really blowed that daylight out. Mm. Uh, none of us were, but there were several of the British I understood who were killed. And, so we hurried up to hook up our trailers to get out of there. And I went to hook mine up and my foot slipped and I came right down on my left side on the tongue of the trailer with a crank on it. It hit right in my side. And I didn't think I was going to be able to get up for a while, but by myself. I got up and got the trailer hooked up and we went on and we took our load up to the, the army through the uh, ammunition depth where we were supposed to and of course the scouts and some of the others they cleaned out all the uh, young Germans that were left and then we started to putting up uh, camouflage to block the view of what was going on and what they were doing was putting together a pontoon bridge mm -hmm. and they it took a couple of weeks I don't remember just uh, the time, but uh, they got this together and at midnight, and I was standing right above where I could see when it was raining and when the lightning flashed, I could see all this down here. And they had the road built down to the river and uh, 
they had a two amphibious vehicles, one called a buffalo and the other alligator, for some reason or another. And they hooked those and they pulled them, one going across this one this, this way, to the bank of the other side of the river. And before they got uh, that hooked, General Patton had a light tank on that bridge going across. And uh, he went 55 miles into the river valley and ran out of gasoline. They thought it, the Germans thought it was a ploy and they didn't attack because they thought we were waiting for them or the General Patton was waiting for them. So we got them fuel, got them fuel and uh, then they went on and they said in that they made a pincer movement from on up the river and down the river and they came in and surrounded them. They said there was possibly a hundred thousand prisoner or a hundred thousand Germans there in the Ruhr Valley, and we took over three hundred thousand prisoners wow. immediately. And uh, of course, the roads were one way, so I had to, we had to go across the bridge and then go on up through and come around another bridge and cross and come back. While we were there, the boys were. Uh, doing the work of camouflaging this so they couldn't see what we were doing. And there was only one man got wounded that I remember that I know of. They had a concrete pillow about this high, ran a long ways on the beach, and the Germans started firing at us. And the British usually stacked the rifles, and uh, they just started dropping my hog up. Uh, What's your uh, rifle? And they, this one said, I say they bloody well take care of themselves. And when he jumped over this uh, concrete pillow, his foot up in the air, and a piece of shrapnel went into his ankle. And it stuck out both sides of his ankle. Wasn't too hard to pull it out. Right? And that was the only casualty that we had there. But um, What developed with your side injury when you were uh, this is something that continued in uh, I no doctor, no first aid, and I started passing blood, and uh, then it got infected, and of course it still stayed in. 45 days later, let me keep up with my notes, uh, Forty-five days later, I was back with my company and had mail of all sorts and even a note that my first daughter was born. And I was I went to the first aid and they said, well, there's nothing we can do right now, but we was going so hard and heavy. Uh, day and night, uh, uh, driving and uh, fighting real hard. And the 97th Infantry Division, that part of ours, was really taking the brunt of the whole thing then in that part of the the uh, war. And said so there wasn't anything they could do. Said, so tough it out if you can. Well, uh, this was back at Camp Lucky Strike. No, 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 this was up the end of the war zone. Okay. And uh, I, I couldn't even tell you where we were okay. because we were so many different places. And uh, to the, we had uh, in the Army, uh, the 97th Infantry Division, you had uh, two uh, units of artillery, two units of uh, infantry, and uh, two signals, signal corps. It was a great big group of people and you had to haul supplies and keep them to all of them spread out everywhere. When I first went into France, I found a book that night that I was on guard. I found a book about this thick and about this big and it had every road, even little paths in Europe in there. And that really proved invaluable to me. I could go anywhere and didn't get lost. And the captain knew it, and so he singled me out for a lot of these uh, duties. And 
in one instant, uh, I was hauling uh, ammunition going to a, an artillery battery, and I knew it couldn't go down across uh, the four lane or the uh, crossing because they had those zeroed in. You couldn't get through there that huge. So I went going to cut across the field and pulled up on the hill, and I happened to see something uh, kind of uh, shine over in a thicket on a bluff, and I backed off on a tank. Come out, I hollered at him, and he came over, and I said, "Look over there and see what you see." So he got his glasses, and he said, "I see three German tanks." Wow. So he pulled around on the side, and three shots, and he got. Them. And uh, wow. then we uh, went on, and I uh, later. Was when I met General Pat. Uh, was he the commanding general of the 97th Infantry? He was the commanding general of the Third Army. Third Army, yes. And the Second Armored Division was his from the beginning. The Hell on Wheels was his outfit from the beginning, and then the latter he was uh, in charge of the Third Army, which the 97th Infantry Division came in under his umbrella. Okay. But uh, I uh, was pulling a pretty heavy load of ammunition and shells, and you don't know whether those things will explode or not if you hit them. And I was pulling up this hill, and it had three tracks, one track here, and then a real wide one where trucks had been coming up and down, and wide enough for two. And I was pulling everything I could, hard I could, and here come vehicles, and it just barely was missing. And over the hill popped this Jeep, and that man standing up in it. And my helmet kind of fell down on my head. And I said, you damn fool, if you don't sit down, you're going to get killed. Ah. And I saw, uh, saw those pistols, and I said, oh, you don't. So ah. he said, are you all right, so? Yeah, I'm all right. If you don't sit down, you're going to get killed. And he said, can you get out? And I said, yeah, you get your Jeep out of the way, and I'll see if I can. So everybody around was scared to death because if he'd hit that truck load, I don't know whether it exploded or not, but it was scared the daylight of all sure. of us. In fact, the General Patton was there enough to scare you. So he backed, the Jeep driver backed up out of the way, and I got it going and went on. And uh, another thing that happened, uh, while we were going there, the uh, uh, chief of staff of the 97th Infantry Division liked for me to pull his trailer. He had a big trailer with all the big safe and everything, and it was real heavy. And uh, he had me pulling it, and we went to a little town, and there in uh, Germany, the the town would be on one side of the road, and the houses in a row over here. And if there were a business, it'd be on this side of the farms. And we were going up there and, and pulling pretty hard, and it got right to the last building. And I stopped and back, pulled her in reverse, like to run over him in the Jeep. And he'd come up and said, What in the world's going on? And I said, You just take a look around that building, you see. There was an anti-aircraft gun with 12 German soldiers on it. They started running, and of course we'd been taught enough uh, German that I knew how to holler them, so I called them, told them come back, take their helmets off, come back. So they did, they came back, and they said, well, what are we going to do with them now? And this colonel, incidentally, was a colonel kid from Indianapolis, Indiana, or at Rushville, actually. And darn. my father had gone with his sister when they were children. And uh, Amazing. He said, well, what are we going to do with these fellows now? Well, this, across the road from these little buildings was a compound, a uh, wire fence as tall, maybe as tall as this ceiling uh, room is. And behind that was concrete block building. And, uh, Went over and it was locked, and I shot the 
lock off and open the gate and we would put them in here. So one old check the building and each door was locked and opened it up and there was 82 or 87 prisoners hmm. uh, uh, chained to the concrete floor and they had a little bit of straw. That's all they had to lie on. And we got them out. American and British and other No, they were uh, Polish, uh, Israeli, just a mixture of everything. One little Polish girl, I hauled a, a load of them out to a compound where they could be cared for, and she was the only girl, and she sat up in the front of the truck because the others had to stand up in the truck, and she gave me a compass. I still have that somewhere, please. But, uh, but she gave me them, and I uh, kept it. Uh -huh. And uh, then we went to gather that prisoners around there and bring them, putting them into that compound. And finally, there were just there was five or six of us, and we got a lot of prisoners in there, and they got to where they weren't going to stay. And here come a man walking up the street with an overcoat on, and, and he walked up in the colonel, told him to get so-and-so out here, and he didn't pay attention. He turned him around and kicked him around. And I laughed, and he said, what in the so-and-so are you laughing about? And I said, you just kept field marshal in the honey. Jerked his overcoat off, and there was all that really rage sword. And he said, we could shoot you. But he couldn't speak English, but they made signs, and he went in and calmed those Germans down. And we got the MPs then to come in and take care. I asked the Colonel, I said, Colonel, what did you say to that field marshal that got him to capitulate? And he said, when you get home, you join the American Legion first thing. Then if you can, you join the Masonic Order and you'll know. So I did and I found it. Uh, what, what did he say? Can you tell us? I couldn't tell you. <laughs> but, uh, uh, then we went, went on and, uh, uh, see. we went from there to, uh, the war was just about over. And we went into Pilsen, Czechoslovakia to cut off the Germans, keep them from going out over into Switzerland or somewhere in that neighborhood. And they were up into Czechoslovakia. So we went up to Pilsen and we left down in the valley on a Sunday morning and it was a beautiful morning. The sun was shining in, in a convoy and we had tanks and everything in the convoy. And I was back fifth or sixth one in the convoy with a pretty good load. and. The, we got about noon and it started sleeting and then it just got really miserable, slick and some of the vehicles slip off the side and uh, they got to where they, some of them they had chain uh, light tanks on them to pull them on up but got up about uh, four o'clock in the afternoon and the uh, captain came back and he stopped and came back and he said, I want you to pull your truck out and come ahead, we're going on in there and get things ready. So, uh, I don't know to uh, widen and get things ready. We went in and they had a huge hotel there. It was a uh, recreational city, skiing and all this. You could look to your right and you could supposed to have been able to see over into Switzerland. And uh, that night, the captain came to me again and said, one well, now, our duty to watch that because he wanted somebody to trust. The rest of them got to go in the hotel. I stayed out in that. And uh, the next morning, uh, a young Hitler youth came, told me that Adolf Hitler and Franklin Roosevelt were both dead. And uh, he went over then to a, a young lieutenant from the Signal Corps was on officer of the day and he came out to, just to check the guard to see what was going on and this Hitler youth asked him for some 
chopped him. And when he put his hand in his pocket, he had shot him. And uh, he shot him. Killed him. Well, he shot him in the stomach. And, uh, pretty bad. I don't know whether he died or not. But uh, this next guard down before I could even move, he had a, we call them grease gun, a little automatic. Mm -hmm. And he shot him. Shot him. Shot him. Cut him in two. And uh, then we moved out from there and went down into uh, Pilsen, Czechoslovakia, down the mountain. And we got in there and they told us that the war had ended. And the people were so happy that they were as dangerous as could be. You know? they didn't, so I told the uh, others with me, I said, let's get out of here. So we went back up the mountain and across. And uh, when we... Uh, Got, I told him, I said, I'll, I'll come last, I'll come behind you, see that everything's all right. And got to the top of the, pretty well top of the mountain. On those mountains, every once in a while, there'd be a sand pit, natural sand. And if you hit that, your truck would bog down pretty hard. And uh, the, not the distributor, but that other little spark thing called spark no trucks, the cap would pop off, and it sounded just like a rifle firing. Hmm. And I just shifted gears and that thing popped off and I thought it had been shot. And I rolled out that there with my rifle up here, machine gun on top, and I did have an old pistol. And I laid there wondering what to do for a minute, and finally it dawned on me what it was. So I got up and put the cap back on and took off down that hill. It was moving pretty fast. That trailer was wobbling as I went down that hill because I was pretty well scared. Uh, we, uh, in one of the trips that I took, I came to a mosaic. There were six of us men driving that day truck, and there was a mosaic in the middle of the street, and this was in Rouen, France. So I stopped, and there was uh, two or three men there, and finally one of them could understand and I asked him what the mosaic was and he told me this is the spot where where Joan oh, yes. Hart was burned to the stake. Right. And I have a picture of that. Uh, couldn't find it this morning, but I have a picture of that. Then uh, uh, we went on back and they decided it was time to give the men a break. So they told me to get three drivers and trucks and go back to La Harve and get the mail. So I went back and we got the mail and brought it back and then they told me to go back and get a load of alcohol, beer, whiskey, Good. champagne. Good. And uh, while I was there, I took a three-day vacation and I went to Paris. Never heard much about it, but I never took drank any of their alcohol, so it made it even. See. But we hauled up back to them and uh, they were uh, uh, in an area there that was safe and the war was over, but there was still a good bit of danger from uh, the citizenry. The, the French were very, very mean towards us. The last shot fired in World War II was fired in our company in our division, I'll put it that way, in the 97th Infantry Division. And I don't remember who it was. And that's pretty much... So that, that brings you now, you get on a boat again. So yeah, I got on a boat, I got on the USS Brazil, and it was a luxury liner, and they took it and covered up the swimming pools and all the fancy woodwork and so forth and made a troop uh, uh, see you, about it. Yeah. Where did you land? New York? We uh, landed in, as I remember, now I was pretty sick, but I, uh, still I was on guard duty and, and on a gun on the outside coming home, but uh, Camp Kilmer, New Jersey, as best I remember, and they walked downtown and one of the boys 
we got to the intersection and of course the people in town from the offices all come out to cheer and so forth and this boy walked out in front of a bunch of these ladies and he had a vial of perfume and he threw it down in the, in the street and broke it and the whole universe is like the women go, oh my. won't smell that perfume and uh, uh, they took me over to the hospital or a sick bay or whatever. In Camp Kilmer. At, at Camp Kilmer and they said they couldn't do a thing. So we were going to Fort Bragg, North Carolina anyway, so he said you can get him on down there to Camp Kilmer, or to Fort Bragg, or Fort Bragg. So I got down to Fort Bragg and they put me in a hospital there. And I was there 15 days and they let me out for a day or two and then I had to go right back. And my division, the 97th Division, was being redeployed to the South Pacific. And I wanted to go with them. My captain came and talked to me, and he said, well, you're too sick. You just cannot go. And he said, you'll be taken care of. Well, the uh, doctors came in, and they said, there's nothing we can do. Said, the only thing I know to do is send him to Oakland, California, to the urological ward there. Said maybe they could help. I do not remember getting to Oakland, California. I don't remember it at all. But I was there, and I don't know how long I was there. But uh, they I was, had to stay in bed, and they uh, checked me and did everything. And one night just before. Uh, lights were out, a full colonel came in, and he was a surgeon, and he said, in the morning, I'm going to operate on you, mm -hmm. I'm going to take your left kidney out, and a portion of your right kidney out, off, and it scared the UVA lights out of me. The lights were off, and a black doctor, and we were segregated yet, black doctor came in and sat down, he told me his name, but I don't remember it, and he said, take my advice, do not allow him to operate on you. Said if he operates, you'll never be well. If you go home, get a good doctor. And said they will kick you out. Said they'll do everything they can to you. Said, uh, but don't let him operate. Well, I lay there all night long, couldn't sleep, of course. And the next morning, four o'clock, two big men rolled that uh, gurney. gurney in. Said roll over, and I said, fellas, I ain't going. And you ain't what? So they went out and him came this doctor and he started cursing me and of course Kentucky temper. And I cursed him back, no doubt about it. And I told him he'd be a damn fool, been hell a long time before he ever touched me or not. And he went storming out there cussing that doctor, black doctor. He said, I know who he was. And he stopped at the door and he turned around and he said, <clears throat> You're going out of this army. I'm going to take all your credits. You and said you won't even know you've been in the Boy Scout too. The next day, I think it was, they took me out of the hospital, put me in a tent out on the parking lot. I wasn't uh, committed to do anything. I didn't have to do anything. I didn't want to. Didn't even have to go eat if I didn't want to, which I don't, didn't feel much like eating anyway. But in a little few days, they put me then in the uh, 4904th Military Police Detachment in Oakland, California. But our company, our division went on to the South Pacific. They went on. But uh, Captain Luella came and talked to me before they left and told me what was going on and uh, did you have continuous correspondence from your home, your mother and father at the time? Or your uh, own brothers? No, no. Uh, no I didn't. Uh, those 45 days I didn't have any correspondence and uh, did they know you were ill? No. They did not? No, they never knew that. Uh, I don't think I don't think they ever knew that. I didn't intend for them to. But uh, they, in the 49th, 49th or 4th, 
they knew that I was, and I saw a doctor fairly regular, not real often, but enough to keep the pain down. This would have been about June or July of 1945, is that 45, something like that. So you were pretty close to the point where we dropped the bombs on Japan. Yes. Yes. Where were you at the time that that happened, and what was your reaction? You know, I really don't know where I thought of this often. Where was I when, when they dropped that bomb, and I do not remember. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember it happened, and of course, we're very happy about it. You were happy about it? Certainly happy about it, because it did stop the war. Mm -hmm. and, and I had kept uh, read up on what was uh, happening and what potentially would happen, that the Japanese said they would not surrender, and how many American lives it was going to cost. Millions. To, to continue the war, and this stopped it. So I had to be happy about it. Uh, One of the many comments about that event was that had we had to invade Japan, it could have easily been the end, the complete end, and the elimination of the United States Marine Corps and the right. troops. That's right. And several of the Army units uh, that I saw in action were just as credible as the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. Marine Corps is a wonderful organization, military-wise, but some of the Army units I'm sure. were just as good. And, uh, some better. Well, yes, sure. yes. Rangers. Uh, in some of the places that they were, yes. Uh, I worked you know, as a military policeman in Oakland, of course, the Chrysler Corporation. No automobile was being built by the United States automotive companies, but Chrysler built a spe special built car for the military police. And I drew one of those and, and drove in San Francisco and Oakland and surrounding, 60 miles surrounding. I picked up the AWL, deserters, and the insane. When did you arrive home then? Uh, finally? Uh, that would have been late 45? I don't remember what. It's 46. 46? 46. 46 from there. Uh, and you were greeted with appreciation and respect? Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, uh, went to work. No, I couldn't work. I came home and I. Uh, went to a Dr. Comer, and uh, then I was in the St. Elizabeth Hospital, I believe five times the first year. Mm -hmm. that was I don't know who paid the bill. I had a bill at the end of the year for $18.75 for the five visits to the hospital. So I have no idea who paid the bill, but I had bought a farm and tried <clears throat> trying to farm and I just couldn't do it. So finally, the doctor, Dr. Comer and others in the hospital told me if I didn't quit trying to work that it would kill me. So then I went to get easy jobs or something. Well, this was an extraordinarily exciting adventure in your lifetime. And to conclude the interview, I'd simply like to say that on behalf of the uh, United States Library of Congress and on behalf of the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County, and on behalf of all the Americans that benefited from your loyal and very courageous and heroic service, thank you very much. Well, you're quite welcome. I don't feel like that I did anything extraordinary. My dear. <laughs>